from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome to the show. I'm Jeff Barnett. Tonight, we have a fascinating show for you. It's a political show. The second half of the show will be a conversation with congressional candidate Mark Levine, who's running in the 8th Congressional District. And it will be a call-in show. He will be calling in to thousands of people uh, with their questions, and we will be handling those for about an hour. But in the first part of the show, we're going to be talking to a real political pro, uh, Peg Willingham. Peg is a grassroots political activist. She is speaking totally for herself tonight, and she has worked on numerous campaigns over the past decade at local, federal, and state levels. She was Congressman Jim Moran's campaign manager. She was a neighborhood team leader for Barack Obama in the 2012 election. She's also a former Foreign Service officer who served in both the Mideast and in Latin America. She speaks Spanish and four other languages to, an, to a degree. Uh, she has a bachelor's from UVA and a master's from the University of uh, Michigan. Uh, so with all of that, Peg, welcome to the show. It is a pleasure to have you here. Jeff, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks. So, big election tomorrow. Yes. Uh, you know the 8th Congressional District of Virginia as well as anyone. So what are the big issues that people are talking about? What do you think the candidates are hearing out on the stump? Well, Jeff, again, thank you for this opportunity. And as you said, I have had the great pleasure of working for Congressman Moran. Uh, and he knows more, really, than anybody. But uh, I, as you said, I'm speaking of my own, on my own behalf. But I have had this wonderful bird's eye view of the district over the last year and a half. And it's so interesting. We were packing up things as he's getting ready for retirement. And I came across the speech that he gave in January of 1991, mm -hmm. when he was being sworn in for the first time. And I was so struck by the fact that one of the issues he really underscored was crime. Right. And I have received uh, mail pieces from most of the primary candidates over the last several weeks, as probably many of your viewers have. And of the 30 or so pieces I've received, none of them has mentioned crime. None of the voters, I think, at debates have mentioned it. It's just completely off the table now, which is a good news story. Uh, crime has really gone down. So the issues that people are focusing on, are, I think many of them are very different from 1991. But a lot has stayed the same. Heavily federal employee and uh, federal contracting district. And we're, you know, we've just continued to grow since then. Yeah. You know, federal contracting is a mess. I think you know, the Obamacare w website is really less about he health care and it's really more about this this, this, this this dysfunctional contracting process that we have, where a company like CGI Federal could get uh, could get the contract to build that website. Uh, are people are people exercised about federal contracting? You know, what what do the federal contractors what do they think, or or are they focus mostly on what what the budget's going to be for these programs? Well, you know, Jeff, it's really all of the above because with the sequester and the general downturn in federal government spending, and especially defense, our district really is disproportionately affected. You know, on the good news side, you know, the 23 years a congressman has been in office, we are an innovation hub, private sector and public sector. We have uh, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency and the National Science Foundation in the 8th District. Of course, the Pentagon is here but also a lot of Fortune 500 technology companies. And so some of their frustrations are, for example, that they'll devote a lot of money on budget, uh, budgeting for bidding and proposals. And that's something you have to spend money on. But then the government will decide to cancel a bid at the last minute when people have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and a lot of employee time. Um, there, there's a whole variety of contracting issues. I know Congressman Moran has had roundtables on a regular basis, and I'm sure whoever wins will know it's a really important constituency to listen to. Yeah. Uh, what are, what are, if you were out there campaigning right now, you know, what is the number one issue you think you'd be hearing from people? I think even though we have a lower unemployment rate than 
Virginia and the country, people are still worried about the economy because we've had so many success problems. We're such a prosperous district, but again, we've relied a lot on those federal dollars. And so the white collar jobs that have really driven our prosperity are a lot of them related to these engineering and other jobs related to contracting. So that's a concern for people. People whose children have gone to our excellent schools have trouble paying back their student loans or finding jobs. So even in this really well-to-do area, people have a lot of concerns about the economy. Yeah. You know, one of the things that people don't talk about is that in, in, in a weak economy, if, even if you have a job, mm -hmm. you're one pink slip away from really disaster because there's no place to go. There's no you know, new job to go towards. And so that's, that's part of the dynamic that we don't hear about. Um, Obamacare, Affordable Care Act, you didn't mention that. Is, that. is that on people's radar? You know, I think it is less of an issue than it was a few months ago when the website was such a big story and the question was around how many people would enroll. And I think that that has sort of moved off the front pages because at least the initial phase seems to be going better now. But it is a big issue for primary voters. And as you know, and as your viewers know, the kind of people who are going to be turning out to vote tomorrow are more interested in politics and generally more to the left of the average voter for Democratic primary. So the Affordable Care Act has been a big theme. Virtually every candidate has said that they will defend it. Um, as you know, here in Virginia, there's a push to expand Medicaid, and we could have a whole hour on that. But um, I think for your average primary voter and all of the candidates have said it's important, and their mailers have talked about how they're going to defend it. Yeah. We've asked uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor Ralph Northam to come on to talk about Medicaid expansion. And so he will be on, on our show at some future date, just haven't nailed that down yet. Did you get any, any blowback from people? Did you hear? Uh, did you hear any blowback from people? Uh, when the tax bills came due, you know, April 15th, there were tax implications uh, from the Affordable Care Act. Did that resonate at all? You know, I think um, the amounts this year are fairly low, and so we haven't heard that much. I think in the out years, as the, the amounts go up and the penalties go up, there may be more. But again, this is a district where uh, I think it is a heavily Democratic district. The president won about 70 percent. So I think most people are fairly positive about it, would like to see some changes, but we haven't heard a lot of blowback. Okay. Uh, when you look at Congress over this next, you know, this next two years, because that's what we're hiring a congressman mm -hmm. for, uh, LGBT equality. What, what do you, do you see any major legislation coming out of Congress in that, in that area? You know, that is an issue that has really changed since the congressman has been in office. Yeah. And I know the show is not a commercial for how great he's been, but that's something he was very good on before he was even in Congress. When he was mayor of Alexandria, he passed anti-discrimination anti legislation for Alexandria city employees. So for a long time, he was ahead of the curve, and he opposed the Defense of Marriage Act and he favored repealing don't ask, don't tell in the military. Um, the one thing that's still pending is, I mean, Defense of Marriage Act, Supreme Court overturned, uh, don't ask, don't tell is gone now, which is great, but there's a piece of legislation uh, called the End, Disc uh, End Discrimination Act, Employment Non-Discrimination Act, sorry, ENDA, and uh, it was passed, I believe, by the Senate and has languished in the Republican-controlled House, so that is something, that's a piece of unfinished business for the next member of Congress to work on. Uh, a piece of unfinished business for the past 20 years has been gun safety. Unfortunately true. Uh, I mean, what's your, I mean, regardless of what, you know, the 8th District congressman or, 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 or woman may mm -hmm. want to do, do you see anything coming out of Congress on that? You know, I think that it's one of the, it's going to be one of the frustrating issues in the near term. Um, I think that uh, the Brady Center, named for Jim Brady, the, President Reagan's secretary, who was gravely wounded by gunfire years ago, is having a big meeting today and a lot of people talking about this issue. And a couple times a week there are headlines, you know, this terrible murder of these police officers, shootings on campus. And the congressman had a town hall meeting last year after Newtown in our district. But 
more than 70% of the people in the audience were NRA members and they were wearing these orange stickers that said, guns save lives, and they drowned out everyone else. And so I think the congressman was glad he made it possible for people to talk about it. He had a wonderful panel of you know, a father whose child died at Virginia Tech, of experts, of law enforcement officials. But you have the single issue voting group in the NRA and, their, and other groups like them, and they really do just tend to rally around this one issue. And we haven't unfortunately yet seen the other side, which I think is a majority of people, including the majority of gun owners, they just haven't been able to punch through yet. You know, I don't hear the term gun control anymore. What I hear is gun safety kind of changing the message. Uh, is, is, that, is that just too fine of a point that I'm putting on it? Or, or do you think that that's, that is kind of a winning way to phrase this conversation? I think it's deliberate. I think you're right to notice it. I think that the word control turns gun owners off. And the idea is just to emphasize, it's not your sportsmen. It's not your target shooters. It's people who are using you know, high capacity weapons to kill people, and that's really the issue. So it is the safety aspect. Um, and it's also that the, the leading cause, the, the leading death that ensues from handgun use is suicide. So it's just a lot of different kinds of violence. So I think, I think it's smart for progressives to emphasize the safety aspect and the violence aspect. Yeah, I didn't hear that, that, uh, that Congressman Moran had been, you know, uh, not assaulted, but confronted by such a large yeah. number in the 8th Congressional District? Well, I would say the overwhelming majority were not from our district. They had, the word had spread. They came from Manassas and further out the, from there. And in fact, one of the panelists was so frustrated, she did ask, hold up, raise your hand if you're in the 8th District. And maybe 25% of the people raised their hand. So they just hijacked the meeting. Yeah. You know, I'm from, uh, originally from Springfield, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, it's a dying mill town now. Mm -hmm. But there's one factory there that's just doing a great business, Smith & Wesson. Oh, boy. <laughs> so yeah. We've got about a minute before, before the first break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to be talking about the environment. We're going to be talking about women's rights, uh, women's health safety, Medicaid expansion, and transportation. For, uh, very quickly, uh, what, what part of this uh, area do you live in? Well, I currently live in the city of Falls Church. I've lived in Fairfax County and Arlington, uh, so I've lived all over the district, but I'm currently a Falls Church resident. Okay. Well, uh, student loans is also on the agenda, payday lenders, and one of the great issues right now is parking at the Mark Center, so we'll be talking about that. I'm Jeff Barnett, I'm here with Peg Willingham, and we'll be back in about uh, two minutes. Art, a universal language, an expression of culture, of self. And now, thanks to Empowered Women International, a way for emerging and established immigrant and refugee artists and artisans to find hope to earn a living while enriching the lives of all of us. Empowered Women International, making a better America every day. For more information on Empowered Women International's educational programs or to make a tax-free donation, contact cfrip at aol.com. tell which kids have trouble with their eyesight. But that's not always the case. Even though one in four children may have a vision problem, eye doctors tell us the symptoms aren't always so obvious. We do know that 80% of all childhood learning is visual. And without good vision, kids can have trouble learning to read. And may fall behind in school. For clues on how to spot the real-life signs of childhood vision problems, 
and what parents can do, visit checkyearly.com. A public service message from the Vision Council of America and reading is fundamental. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back. I'm Jeff Barnett. We're getting the inside scoop from Peg Willingham, a grassroots political consultant, a former uh, campaign manager for the incumbent uh, congressman in the 8th Congressional District, Jim Moran. And she is an expert on uh, the 8th Congressional District and, of course, with tomorrow's primary, uh, with polls opening up at 7 o'clock. This is an excellent topic for us tonight. We've talked about... Uh, government spending, we've talked about Obamacare, we've talked about LGBT equality, we've talked about gun safety, but there are a host of real hot button issues that we're now gonna turn to. The environment, uh, not just, well, uh, not just uh, global warming, but the carbon tax. Uh, that has been uh, an issue that's been raised and gotten more visibility these last few weeks. So. Are, again, is this something that is, uh, that is visceral to the people in the 8th District? I think the environment is the top issue for quite a few voters and for yeah. some of the candidates have said it's their signature issue. And they'd be following in some good footsteps because the congressman, Congressman Moran, has served on the Department of the Interior Appropriations Subcommittee, which means the, the agency that supervises all of the federal lands and environmental issues. And he's really passionate about it. And again, it's an issue that has only grown since he's been in office. Um, he issued a press release praising the president for this past week's decision on the carbon tax mm -hmm. or on reducing carbon emissions 30 percent. Now, the 8th District, of course, is very different from other parts of Virginia that really heavily rely on coal and they blame the president for what's happening but really it's actually fracking and cheaper natural gas is doing a lot of it but it doesn't matter they blame the president in this area people appreciate what the president is doing and I think any member of Congress who's gonna be serving the 8th district is gonna continue to champion those issues too. Right. You, know, you mentioned that, that Congressman Moran, Jim Moran was on the Appropriations Committee mm -hmm. Uh, Frank Wolf from the 10th Congressional District uh, was also on the Appropriations Committee. And so this area kind of had a, um, a yin and a yang, one Republican, one Democrat from this area on approach. Now that's all happened. That's all gone. Uh, we're losing that. Uh, Frank Wolf is also retiring. Uh, do you have any ideas or is there any thoughts about? what that lack, uh, that loss of presence on the Appropriations Committee might mean to this area in, in at least the short term. Well, I think you're absolutely right that it will be a big change because the 8th District is such a safe seat. And again, that really changed. When the congressman first ran in 1990, he was not considered a favorite. It was an upset victory in what was then more Stan Republican. Paris. Stan Paris. That Republican was, uh, congressman. I gladly That's voted right. against him, I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but didn't think the congressman would win, and he did, Congressman Moran. But um, the, the Appropriations Committee now is it's such a plum assignment that the Democratic uh, congressional leadership tends to give those coveted positions to people who are on the front lines in districts that are not as safe as our district. So my guess, and this is just a guess, is the next representative from our district will not be on the Appropriations Committee because they'll want to give it to somebody. For example, if John Faust wins, he is in a more red to blue district and maybe they would give him an appropriation seat just to help him stay more securely in his seat. So that's sort of how the sausage is made. It's too bad, but that is how it works. Um, so whoever wins tomorrow will likely win in November and will passionately defend the interest of our district, but it isn't the same as when you have the whole purse strings. Although over the last few years, since earmarks were eliminated, um, no member of Congress right. really has what they used to have, and people will rail against earmarks and say it's pork barrel spending and it's government waste. But first of all, as you know, very small percentage of the budget, and it actually gave people something to trade. And one of the reasons we have gridlock is we don't have 
earmarks anymore. And so you can't cut a deal with somebody and say, if you'll help me with this, I'll help you get that basketball stadium built at your local college. And so it's, it's one of the many factors behind the gridlock. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, the administration, the executive branch, can earmark all day long. They can say, we're going to buy 20 uh, F-16s from Lockheed Martin. But a local congressman cannot do the same thing. And it's it's really, it is rather a, um, a bizarre uh, setup that we have right now. Uh, Peg mentioned John Faust. John Faust, of course, is the Democrat running for Congress in Virginia's 10th congressional district. So that's McLean and then westward out to the West Virginia border. So he already has that nomination. Uh, we're not talking about the 8th congressional district, which is Falls Church, which is Arlington, uh, Alexandria, and then about almost half of it is the southern part of Fairfax County, pretty much along the uh, along the Potomac. Uh, women's health, uh, one of the most divisive issues in America today, and one of the reasons for polarization uh, among the among the two parties. I mean, there are very few. Uh, we we'll call it pro-choice Republicans or pro-life Democrats. Uh, again, do you see um, uh, do you see any any uh, groundswell of opinion kind of in one part of this in the eighth district, or or and or do you see any real shift happening in the near term in Congress? Well, in the 8th District, again, we're, we're a very progressive district if you just look at election results. And women do tend to vote more than men do nationally. And single women have become a very coveted demographic for the Democratic Party. So we saw last year that Terry McAuliffe and Ralph Northam and Mark Herring very explicitly appealed to women voters and on the issue of women's health. And that helped them, I think, significantly when it came to winning those elections. So any candidate who's a Democrat running in the 8th District is going to you know, highlight that they will be on the side of reproductive choice. But I don't see Congress uh, coming to any consensus on this issue. And as you know, around the country, state by state, including in Virginia, uh, on the state level, regulations are being passed to make access to abortion much more difficult. So it's, it is really still a very much divisive issue, as you said, and lots, lots more to see down the road. Uh, Peg, do you see any shift happening uh, you know, in, in the short term, you know, five years? I mean, is there any, do you see any kind of rays of light that, 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 that a consensus can form? Or is this just going to be a, a head-butting uh, issue? I, I, don't, I actually don't see many yeah. rays of light, I hate to say it. I, the only thing that I think is that as Republicans look at uh, demographics, both in terms of Latinos, but also looking at women, and as, again, single women are a more important part of their demographic, if they want to appeal to them, they may have to change. But I don't see that happening anytime soon. Yeah. Uh, transportation. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are times when I am just kind of a prisoner, either in my home or in my office. Uh, and uh, uh, you have to leave 45 minutes early just in, for a 15 minute drive, just in case. Uh, at the federal level, is, you know, what, what, what has been done recently by Congressman Moran, uh, or more really, more to the point, what can be done these next couple of years? Well, you know, Jeff, uh, I've enjoyed talking about these sort of big picture issues that we've been yeah. covering. But as everybody in Northern Virginia knows, traffic really is probably the number one issue for people on a day in, day out basis. It's an economic challenge because it means we can't get goods to market fast enough. A lot of people waste time. But it also just frustrates people. And so when I first started working for Congressman Moran as his campaign manager, I was surprised to hear uh, that in the 2012 election, one of the things that people would mention over and over was, well, he helped us on a traffic issue. And I right. thought, but he's such a champion on these big, you know, progressive issues. But uh, one was that through the base realignment and closing act, the process that's affected the whole country, but especially our area, they were going to move a lot of employees from Crystal City and elsewhere to Fort Belvoir and dump 
not to say dump, these are important people doing important jobs, but their cars being dumped on the roads. And so the so congressman- So the Route 1 corridor. Route 1 corridor. So the congressman worked with Congressman Wolf and right. others, I have to definitely give credit, uh, they worked well together to make sure that there would be some funding to widen Route 1. So he got $180 million to widen Route 1. And also, on the flip side, the Department of Defense built a huge building at Landmark on 395 in Alexandria with no provision for what to do with all those extra cars. There's no public transit, so the congressman got legislation. Is that the Mark Center? Exactly, sorry, it is the Mark Center. And uh, he got legislation to limit the number of parking spaces. And that may seem like such a nitty gritty thing to do when there are all these big national issues, but people love that because it meant not as many cars would be on the roads. And so, strangely enough, you know, there's this macro and micro work that members of Congress do, and transportation and parking have definitely been a big part of what people appreciated from both sides of the aisle for him in 2012. Yeah, all politics are local. Absolutely. Uh, another very local issue, payday lending. And that's turned out to be, more people know about it, the more comfortable that, that we are with it. Uh, do you see that uh, changing the next in the next couple of years? You know, it is an issue that one or two of the candidates for tomorrow's election have raised, and I think everybody would agree these are really exploitative practices where they take advantage of low-income people and of service members and veterans to lend money at an exorbitant rate. Um, I don't think it's going to be the top issue or even in the top five for a lot of primary voters tomorrow. I think it's one that uh, you know progressives care about and they should because there are a lot of them in our district and they do prey on low income people, but those folks probably aren't gonna be voting in large numbers tomorrow. Yeah, we got about a little over a minute left. Let's just kind of think for a second. What do you th believe will be the top and, you know, one, two, three, four issues that are going to really decide tomorrow's election? Well, you know, the congressman has not endorsed anyone and all seven of the candidates have a lot going for them. I think that for primary voters, um, I will say I haven't heard a huge groundswell of passion from a lot of people. There's passion around some of the candidates and all the candidates have some people who are passionate, but it's not an obvious uh, election around one or two things or one or two people. But I think they'll want to see the good things to continue. Uh, the people who have liked what they've seen for these last 20 years will want to see it continue from constituent services to progressive values to prosperity for our district and especially taking care of federal employees military and retirees, contractors, but also everyone from immigrant taxi drivers to CEOs, uh, you know, called or wrote to the congressman to say they were sorry he was leaving because he had done things for them, right. and the next congressman will too. And as a veteran, I can say he's done a lot for us. Peg, thank you very much. Sure, thank you. It is